Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we come before your throne in the powerful name of Jesus. We need the help of the Holy Spirit now as we open your holy word. I ask that you will remove from our hearts any obstacle that would keep us from hearing your voice. I ask that you will give us a sincere heart to receive what we study, to investigate it, and to apply it to our lives. Thank you for being with us and for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In our last study together, we looked at the historical fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24 and the prophetic fulfillment of the same chapter. But we only studied Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 14. Now we are going to study the abomination of desolation, part 1. And in our next lecture, we will take a look at the abomination of desolation, part 2. So it's going to take us two sessions to deal with the abomination of desolation in the end time, because we've already looked at its fulfillment in the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, in order to know where the context is for the abomination of desolation, we need to review the sequence of events that we studied in our last presentation. So I'm quickly going to go through the different events in chronological order as they will occur at the end of time. First of all, we noticed that false messiahs will arise. And there have been false messiahs that have arisen. And I'm sure that we will be seeing more as time passes. Then we have wars and rumors of wars. Nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then also we have a mention of pestilences, famines, earthquakes, and troubles in society. Now these things are going to get worse and worse. Because Matthew chapter 20 verse 8, 24 verse 8 says that these things are only the beginning of sorrows. And in Great Controversy, page 590, Ellen White wrote that these visitations, or these disasters, are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Now, where are we in the fulfillment of Matthew 24? We are at verse 8. We are between verse 8 and verse 9. And somebody might say, oh, well, so there's still a long time before uh, the end of the chapter, you know, from verse uh, 8 all the way to verse 31, where it speaks about Jesus sending the angels to pick up the elect. Oh, we have plenty of time to spare yet. No, because we are told that the final movements will be rapid ones. In other words, we can't say that just because eight verses have been fulfilled, and uh, verse 8 through uh, verse 31 have not yet been fully fulfilled, that we have plenty of time to get ready. Now, we notice the reason why these disasters in society and in nature are going to occur. It's because Satan wants to blame God's people. Now, how do we know that we're, we are now between verse 8 and verse 9? Well, because verse 8 says, that um, the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes are the beginning of sorrows. And then verse 9 begins by saying, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That hasn't happened yet. You know, God's people are not being persecuted at this time, going into tribulation and having all nations hate them. It's just not happening right now. So we are between verse 8 and verse 9, the disasters are going to get more and more uh, frequent and they're going to be worse and worse until the point where Satan will convince uh, the populace of the world that God's people are causing these problems. And then you notice in verse 9 that uh, God's people will be thrown into tribulation. I want you to notice it doesn't say the great tribulation. It says tribulation. 
The great tribulation comes later. This is a preliminary time of trouble or a little time of trouble for God's people when they will be blamed for the disasters that are taking place. And then we notice that during this period, family members will betray family members and friends will betray friends. And the the prophecy tells us that at this time when persecution comes, many will be offended. In other words, many of those who walked with the Lord, many of those who profess to be followers of Jesus, in order to spare themselves from persecution, they will be offended and they will forsake the truth. At this same time, there will be false prophets, according to verse 11. And the false prophets are those who went astray from God's people, and now they will use all of their powers to try and deceive the elect and to speak against them in uh, tribunals and before the great leaders of the world. And this brings me to my next point. God's people would be required to give testimony before great political leaders of the world, before presidents, legislators, rulers, and magistrates. And God's people will not have to be concerned because God will pour out the latter rain power for them to be able to give the loud cry. And they won't have to worry about what to say because the Holy Spirit will enlighten them, will give them wisdom and words to speak. And we found in our last study that thousands upon thousands will accept the truth as a result of the proclamation of the loud cry under the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we're told that because of transgression of the law, the love of many will grow cold. And we read a statement where it says that these people whose love grows cold, they once had a high spiritual experience with Jesus, but they will apostatize because of lawlessness or because of the transgression of the law. Then the prophecy tells us that during this time, God's people are going to need perseverance. They're going to need patience. And we are told, we are given the promise that those who persevere or those who endure till the end will be saved. And then the final sign that we looked at is the preaching of the gospel to all of the world and then the end will come. And we connected this with the first angel's message. The first angel takes the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But it's the presentation of the gospel in a special end time con context where the hour of God's judgment is proclaimed. In other words, God's people will say, we are now in the hour of God's judgment. You have to make your decision now like those who were in Jerusalem had to make their decision to leave or to stay. And then the first angel's message also calls people to worship the one who created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. In other words, it is a call to worship the Creator, and the sign of the Creator is the Holy Sabbath. So basically, this is the context, the previous context, to what we are going to study here in part one of the abomination of desolation, the end time fulfillment. So now we are going to take a look at verses 15 to 20 of Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to see that there are several things that are mentioned in those verses. Number one, the abomination of desolation. It will divide the human race into two groups, just like the sign outside Jerusalem in the year AD 70 divided the city into two groups, those who left and those who stayed. Secondly, as a result of seeing the abomination of desolation, then there is the flight. God's people will have to flee from the cities because they will be persecuted. And then you have the great tribulation. The word great is added. This is not the preliminary tribulation, the little time of trouble or the short time of trouble where God's people will be persecuted and there will be martyrs. No, the great tribulation, there will be no martyrs because the great tribulation, when it comes, probation has closed. So then you have the great tribulation, and a very interesting detail is that all of those who flee at this time are Sabbath keepers, because we are told uh, by Jesus, pray that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. 
Now, what we need to do is then to understand the abomination of desolation as it fulfills in the end time in Bible prophecy. And for this, we need to go back and review what we studied in the historical application of the abomination of desolation in events that led up to the year 70, between 66 and year, the year 70. So I'm going to review now the abomination of desolation that surrounded Jerusalem before the destruction of the city in the year 70 AD. Now I'm going to talk about the Roman eagle standard. If you want a picture of this standard, in the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, Volume 1, page 347, there's a picture of the Roman standard. Let me describe what is on that standard. There is an eagle. The head of the eagle is facing right. The wings of the eagle are outstretched. And in his talons, the eagle has arrows. Surrounding the eagle is a golden wreath representing the orb of the sun. And we know that when the Roman uh, legions surrounded a city, besieged the city, the first thing that they would do after they surrounded the city was to put their Roman standards into the ground and then they would kneel and they would render them worship according to Flavius Josephus. They were actually rendering worship to the sun god Mithra because in the year 63 BC, Pompey adopted the eagle as the sole uh, beast on the Roman standard. And so you find uh, this information on the standard of the Roman legions. So what Jesus was saying is, when you see the abomination of desolation that was prophesied by Daniel, he was saying to his faithful followers, flee. Now, what is the abomination of desolation? As we noticed in Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, Jesus said, when you see it's Jerusalem surrounded by armies. So the abomination of desolation is the surrounding of Jerusalem by the Roman legions. At that moment, the faithful, when they saw the sign of the Romans, of the Roman legions placing their standards in the ground and kneeling and rendering worship to the sun god, they were to take that as a sign to flee from the city. However, there was a problem. When Cestius Gallus came to the city of Jerusalem in the year 66 and besieged the city, it looked like he was going to be successful in conquering the city at that point. Everything seemed to indicate that the city was going to fall. But then something strange happened. Josephus says, without any explanation. We know that there's an explanation because Jesus had prophesied that there was going to be a sign that would indicate that his people were supposed to flee. What happened was that Cestius Gallus suddenly withdrew from the siege of the city. All of the Roman legions, along with their general, left the city and fled back to Rome. The unfaithful who were within the city of Jerusalem said, this is clearly a sign that God is blessing us and God is giving us the victory. And of course, the false prophets in the city, they said, we told you that there was going to be peace. We told you that this city would never fall. And so, and so at that time, uh, Cestius Gallus goes back to Rome and the Jewish uh, uh, armies if you please, go after him. And according to Josephus, several of the Roman soldiers perished when they were attacked by the Jews. However, the Christians that were within the city that knew what Jesus had said in this very sermon, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. That is the time to flee. And so the Christians at that moment fled the city because the city was no longer besieged. Well, it just so happens that just uh, 
Three years later, Vespasian came against the city, and then after him, Titus. And they surrounded the city, they besieged it like a wall where there was no escape, and everyone in the city perished. Very interesting. But not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. When I say that everyone in the city perished, I'm not saying that they were killed. What I'm saying is that they were either killed or they were sold as slaves to different nations by the Romans. Now you say, what does this have to do with the end time abomination of desolation? In order to understand this, we need to comprehend that what happened with literal Jerusalem in a literal location with the literal Jews symbolizes global events with God's spiritual people, no longer literal Jerusalem, but with God's spiritual people at the four angles of the earth. There also has to be a connection between the Roman standard and the sign that God's people are going to see at the end of time that indicates that they're supposed to flee. It must have something to do with an eagle and the sun. The final sign must have something to do with the eagle and the sun because that was the sign that led the faithful to flee Jerusalem when they left the first time. So now you say, well, how do you explain then this in the end time? What is the abomination of desolation at the end of time? In order to understand this, we need to look at the great seal of the United States of America. Now, if you have a $1 bill, I just have a $1 bill here, uh, and uh, you'll find on one side of the $1 bill, not on the side where George Washington is, but on the other side you'll find two circles, one on the left and one on the right. These two circles are both sides of what is known as the Great Seal of the United States. How important is the Great Seal of the United States of America? Well, let me read you a quotation on someone who is an expert on United States, the United States flag and also other insignia. This is the explanation of the importance of the Great Seal, also known as the State of Arms of the United States. It reads like this, The Great Seal, or State of Arms, is the official emblem of the United States. All judicial, legislative, and executive proclamations bear this seal. So you have the three branches of government, the executive, the judicial, and the legislative branches of the government. So it says it's the official emblem, and all judicial, legislative, and executive proclamations bear this seal. Then it says it certifies and authenticates all official acts of the federal government. It must appear on all its authoritative laws and statutes. Wow, interesting. What are the main points? It is the official emblem. It must be in all judicial, legislative, and executive proclamations. It certifies and authenticates official acts. And it must be on all laws and statutes of the United States of America. So let's take a look at a little history of the Great Seal of the United States. On July 4, 1776, of course, as probably most of you know, the Declaration of Independence of the United States from England was signed. And at that time, the very time, a Great Seal Committee was created to adopt a national official seal for the newborn nation. Among the members of that Great Seal Committee were Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams, three of the very famous founders of the Republic of the United States. Now in that meeting, Benjamin Franklin suggested that the, that the country should ad adopt a turkey as its national emblem. And I praise the Lord 
that the committee did not listen to Benjamin Franklin. The committee tabled its deliberations after a lengthy discussion. And so three additional committee, committees convened after this and our present seal, as it's found on the $1 bill, was adopted on June 28, 1772, just six years after the Declaration of Independence. This seal was adopted before the Constitution was ratified in 1787 and before the Bill of Rights was enacted in the year 1791. In other words, the Great Seal is not a recent, recent innovation. The Great Seal goes all the way back to the roots of our Republic, adopted once again in 1772. So it would be a good idea for us to take a look at the Great Seal, both sides of the Great Seal of the United States of America. So let's take a look, first of all, at the front side of the seal. And that's the circle that you have on the right side of the bill if you have it right before you. You'll notice there that there is a native bald eagle. The face of the eagle is facing right. You'll notice also that the wings of the eagle are outstretched. And in the talons of the eagle, you have arrows. Now that's notable because in that day, the, uh, the actual weapon that was used was muskets, not bows and arrows. And so there's, there's something very significant about the fact that you have arrows here. Now what is the meaning? Oh, by the way, you'll notice also that above the eagle, you have the rays of the sun breaking through the clouds. Now what is the meaning of the sun uh, rays breaking through the clouds? Well, we find in a book about flags the following explanation. In a large number of lands, the sun is associated not so much with independence, but with the promises it brings in the dawn of a new day. So notice that the sun was a symbol of the dawn of a new day because the United States was just beginning. It was the dawn of a new nation. Toward the end of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, George Washington, the first president of the United States, uh, sat in a special chair and presided over the convention. The name of the chair was the Rising Sun Chair. And on the backrest of this chair is a beautifully carved sun. Benjamin Franklin, who sat among the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, had a very interesting comment about this particular chair. This is what Benjamin Franklin said. I have often looked at that sun behind the president without being able to tell whether it was a rising or setting sun. But now at length, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun because it was the dawn of a new day. In other words, a new nation with great promise of peace and prosperity had just been founded. Now let me just get ahead of myself a little bit now. In the midst of the terrible disasters that are going to become more frequent and more terrible, according to what we read in the, great, in the book, The Great Controversy, things are going to fall apart in the United States of America. However, Ellen White states that the, that the government will believe instigated by the religious powers of the United States, that enforcing the day of the sun, enforcing Sunday, will bring back peace and prosperity to the United States. That's in Great Controversy, pages 588 and 589. Now somebody might say, well, Pastor Bohr, all of these details that uh, are similar on the U.S. seal to what the Roman standard have had, 
it must be coincidental. It must be an accident, but it's not. Let me share with you four reasons why the connection between the Roman standard and the great seal of the United States of America are linked or connected together. Number one, we've already noticed that Matthew chapter 24 has a dual fulfillment. In other words, it is fulfilled in events that lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem, and it will be fulfilled on a larger and greater scale at the end of time. What does that mean? It means that in some sense, the eagle and the sun in the end time must be a sign as it was previous to the destruction of Jerusalem. Secondly, the United States itself testifies that it got its emblems, emblems from the Roman Empire. So the United States says, we got these from the Roman Empire. Let me read you another quotation from uh, an expert in flags uh, across the world. Uh, this is how it reads. The neoclassical spirit of America at the end of the 18th century looked to the ancient, now listen carefully, looked to the ancient republic for many symbols. So once again, the neoclassical spirit of America at the end of the 18th century looked to the ancient Roman Republic for many symbols, including the name of the upper chamber of Congress, that is the Senate. In Rome, the eagle began as a Republican symbol. Hence, Americans chose their native bald eagle for the national arms in 1782. So you'll notice that the United States itself says, we got the emblems on our great seal from Rome. And we also notice that because Matthew 24 has a dual fulfillment, the eagle and son of the Roman standards must have something to do with the end time fulfillment. Point number three. In 1891, A.T. Jones published a very important volume. It is a massive volume. I think it has around a thousand pages. The name of this book is The Two Republics, or Rome and the United States of America. In this fascinating book, he shows the parallels between the ancient Ro Roman Republic and the Republic of the United States. There are so many striking similarities between the two. And number four, as we shall see towards the end of our study together, Ellen White explicitly linked the Roman standards that surrounded Jerusalem with the national day of the sun at the end of time. Now we need to take a look also at the reverse side of the great seal on the one dollar bill. You find in the circle on the left hand side of the one dollar bill a sycorat, a tower that is unfinished. You'll notice that the top is unfinished. At the top of the pyramid you have what is known as the Eye of Providence. It's really the Eye of Lucifer. And coming forth from the Eye are the rays of the sun once again. Everybody agrees that this is a Masonic symbol. Now you'll notice also that you have here uh, some inscriptions uh, on this uh, side of the seal. You'll notice, uh, for example, uh, the expression uh, Novus Ordo Seclorum. You say, what does that mean, Novus Ordo Seclorum? Well, it means New World Order, and you thought that that was something recent. And you'll also notice that above it you have the inscription Anuit Coeptis, which means uh, He has blessed our undertaking. He has blessed our undertaking. So you'll notice here uh, uh, another very interesting details, and you have to really have good eyesight to catch this. You'll notice at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the year 1776 in Roman numerals. So you have all of these inscriptions in Latin, which is the language of ancient Rome. Anuit queptis, he has favored our undertaking. Novus ordo seclorum, that is a new world order. And by the way, on the other side of the seal, which I failed to mention, you have the words e pluribus unum, which in Latin means out of the many, one. 
And so you find these Latin inscriptions, you have Roman numerals, you have the sun burst above the eagle, the sun burst coming forth from the eye, you have the eagle looking right, wings spread out, talons with arrows. Clearly there is a connection between the two. Now let me tell you something about uh, this particular seal. Henry Wallace was vice president during the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. We know that uh, Henry Wallace was a 32nd degree Mason. So you might be wondering how these two sides of the seal ended up on a one dollar bill. Well, Henry Wallace suggested minting a coin that would have the great seal on it. Instead, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was also a 32nd degree Freemason, placed the great seal on the one dollar bill in the year 1935. And once again, I emphasize that you have the sun, you have the eagle, you have the outstretched wings, you have the eagle looking right, you have arrows in the talons, you have inscriptions in Latin, and you have the date for the Declaration of Independence in Roman numerals. There is clearly a connection between the Roman standards and the great seal of the United States of America. Now what about the architecture of Washington, D.C.? Well, if you've been to Washington, D.C., something is very striking. And that is that the main government buildings are composed of Roman architectural structures. For example, the Capitol, the White House, the Supreme Court, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, all hark back to the architecture of ancient Rome. Let me read you a statement that appears on a government site about the reason why these buildings have a Roman architectural structure. This is how it reads. The definitive architectural style on Capitol Hill is neoclassical, inspired by the use of ancient Greek and Roman styles in the design of great, great public buildings. These styles are recognized by the use of tall columns, symmetrical shapes, triangular, pedi triangular pediments, that's the triangle at the top of the building, and domed roofs. The statement continues, Thomas Jefferson wanted Congress housed in a replica of an ancient Roman temple. Wow! So what did Jefferson want? He wanted Congress housed in a replica of an ancient Roman temple. Since the capital in Richmond, Virginia was an example of Roman cubic architecture, he thought the federal capital should be modeled after a spherical temple. The U.S. Capitol's designs derived from ancient Greece and Rome, evoked the details that guided the nation's founders as they framed their new republic. The architecture in Washington, D.C. is a Roman. Not only that, but you find in Washington, D.C. monuments everywhere you go. These monuments and statues remember great historical events in the course of U.S. history. And you have heroes on those particular statues and they commemorate great historical events just like Rome was filled with statues of its heroes and of historical events. Many times the inscriptions on these statues are in Latin, in other words in Roman numerals as well. The date is given in Roman numerals. Now what is the name of the upper chamber of Congress of the United States? It's called the Senate. Where does that come from? Well, obviously it comes from ancient Rome because the Romans had a Senate. And the representatives who serve in the Senate are called senators, just like in ancient Rome. There's another interesting detail. In the wars of independence of the United States, the name troops in the United States was not very well received. 
they preferred to call the uh, armies legions. And today we still have, as a fruit of that, the American Legion. Let me read you a statement here that we find um, in a book by Cochin James, where it says the following, The Legion of the United States was a reorganization and extension of the Continental Army from 1792 to 1796 under the command of Major General Anthony Wayne. It represented a political shift in the new United States, which had recently adopted the United States con Constitution. The new congressive, congressional and executive branches authorized a standing army composed of professional soldiers rather than relying on state militias. In other words, they preferred the armies to be called legions. At this time, General Knox suggested the creation of a super flag with a life-sized eagle which would be called the standard of the legion. Although the flag never came into existence, it shows the fascination of the United States Republic with Rome in antiquity. In 1791, a similar flag was created and given the name the Standard of the Eagle. Interestingly enough, this flag has an eagle with outstretched wings, facing right, with arrows in its talons, and a huge sunburst coming forth from its body. Somebody might object and say, Pastor Bohr, what right do you have to link the Roman eagle with the eagle of the United States? They're so distant in time and place. After all, Mexico also has an eagle as its national emblem. Wouldn't we have to connect the English lion with the Babylonian lion? Wouldn't we have to connect the Russian bear with the Medo-Persian bear? Wouldn't we have to connect the Chinese dragon with the Roman dragon if we connect the Roman eagle with the eagle of the United States? The answer is no on four counts. First of all, England, Russia, and China do not claim to have gotten their mascots from Babylon, Medo-Persia, or Rome. Second, there is no historical connection between the religion of ancient Babylon and England, the religion of Russia and ancient Medo-Persia, and the religion of Rome and China. Number three, A.T. Jones, as I mentioned before, wrote this massive book, The Two Republics, or Rome and the United States of America, where he described in minute detail the similarity of the Republic of Rome with the Republic of the United States of America. And number four, we know that there is a connection because Ellen White wrote two extremely significant statements. And now I want to read those statements where Ellen White states that the eagle and the sun on the Roman standard as the sign for Christians to flee Jerusalem has an end time application where the United States with the eagle and the sun also uh, have this sign of the need for God's people to uh, flee when this sign is seen. The first statement is in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 451. As the approach of the Roman armies was a sign to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so notice, as the approach of the Roman armies was a sign to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy, if you read the paragraph before, it's talking about the apostasy concerning the day of worship. Sunday that Protestants embraced by tradition from Roman Catholicism. So once again, as the approach of the Roman armies was assigned to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy concerning Sunday be a sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. In other words, this is the last thing before the close of probation. The sign, the abomination of desolation. That will divide the world into two groups. Those who stay and those who flee. Once again, I go back a little ways. She continues saying, 
um, the people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress which prophets has des have described as the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the great tribulation that's mentioned in verse 21 after the abomination of desolation is described in verses 15 through 20. Now there's another statement that is even more explicit. This one is in five testimonies, 464 and 465. 464 and 465. It is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affections on laying up treasure in the world. In other words, it's not time for us to be accumulating money and uh, possessions. As you know, they're very uncertain in these days of the coronavirus, what's happening to the stock market and so on. There's only one place that we can truly invest our means, and that is in the bank of heaven by using our resources to win souls to the kingdom. So she continues, the time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. And now comes the comparison. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so, now comes the application to the end time, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. So as the Roman standard had the sun and the eagle, and it was the sign for God's people to flee, at the same time, by the way, they rendered worship to their sun standard, their eagle standard. She says, so the sign of the Sunday law in the United States will be a sign that we are supposed to do what the original Christians did. What did they do? They fled. So once again, I go back a little ways in this quotation. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. Let me just stop there once. There's a lot of talk in Seventh-day Adventist circles about when we are supposed to leave the cities. Now, it's always best to live in the country. As you've noticed, what has been happening in the cities during this time of the coronavirus and uh, during this time of unrest, you know, it's a pretty risky thing to have a business in the city or to live in the city. So it's always best to live out in the country. But when is the moment that God indicates that it is the last opportunity to leave the cities? She states, once again, uh, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nations in the decree, now notice, enforcing the papal Sabbath. So it's not talking about they're talking about a Sunday law, the Congress is debating a Sunday law. No, this is when the Sunday law has already been written and approved and stamped. So it says it, uh, enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. And then she states this, it will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. And then she gives this counsel to us. And now, instead of seeking expensive dwellings here, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even a heavenly Instead of spending our means in self-gratification, we should be studying to economize. So just as Ellen White presents her sequence of events is what we find in Matthew chapter 24. You have the sign, then you have the flight, then you have the great tribulation. That's in Matthew chapter 24. The sign is in Matthew 24 and verse 15 through verse 20. And then uh, verse uh, 21 uh, and following, you have the great tribulation that ensues. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 24 and notice verses 16 through verse 20. Because we only noticed verse 15 so far. So Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, 
spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then, so when the sign is seen, something needs to happen after that, immediately after that. Remember the word then. It is the Greek word tote, which describes an event that occurs immediately after another event. So once again, it says in verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. In our case, it would be those who are in the great cities. Flee, go to desolate places of the earth. And then in verse 17, we find these words, Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. We've noticed this before. In other words, don't think about all the toys that are left in your house, your beautiful car that's left in your house, the money that you have under the mattress of your bed. No, because now it is urgent to flee. Because the abomination of desolation has been seen, probation is about to close. It says in verse 18, And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. In other words, don't think about the past, what you have in terms of material possessions. It is time now to flee because those material possessions are not going to do you any good. And then we find in verse 19 the difficulty of this flight. It says in verse 19, But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. You know, fleeing when a, person, when a woman is pregnant or nursing a baby would be a great trial, fleeing and at the same time taking care of the pregnancy or of the baby. And then we find this very significant verse. You know, many times uh, Adventist evangelists use this verse to prove that the Sabbath was kept uh, long after Jesus died on the cross, it was still being kept in the year 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. However, it's important for us to take into account the context in which this verse appears. Very interesting context. It appears in the context of the great tribulation of the flight because the sign of the Sunday law has been seen. In contrast to those who observe Sunday, what are God's true people going to be doing? We find in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20 these words, And pray that your flight may not be in winter, because it gets very cold in winter in Jerusalem, by the way. I've been there in, in late fall, and uh, it, it, you know, it's rainy and it's very, very miserable. But not only pray that your flight not be in winter, it says, or on what? Or on the Sabbath. So those who flee are Sabbath keepers. They keep the seventh day Sabbath. In contrast to those who see the sign and ignore it, the sign of Sunday are those who observe God's seventh day Sabbath. Now there are those who say, well, you know, the Sabbath was of the Jews. The Sabbath is not for Christians. Well, where do they get that from? Well, they get it from certain verses, such as Exodus chapter 31 and verses 16 and 17. Exodus 31 and verses 16 and 17. It says there, speaking about the Sabbath, it is a sign, God says, between me and the children of Israel forever. So they say, see, the Sabbath is a sign, yes, between the children of Israel and God. It's a sign between the Jews and God. It doesn't apply to us. However, the text does not say it is a, it exclusively a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. By the way, who is Israel today? Well, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, we find who Israel is today. I will go there in a moment. It says, If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Jews today, Israel today, are those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So when it says that the Sabbath is a sign between the children of Israel and God forever, 
the children of Israel are those who are joined to Christ. So the Sabbath must still be the same day that we are supposed to keep. The text in Exodus continues, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And then we have the reason. The reason is not because God took Israel out of Egypt primarily, although the Sabbath has a secondary dimension which has to do with the Exodus. The reason that is given here is very clear. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day He rested and was refreshed. So why is the sign uh, a sign between God and Israel? It's because God created this world and rested on the seventh day. Now the question is, does the creation of the world apply only to the Jews as a sign or remembrance of the true Creator God? Absolutely not. If you go back to Genesis, you'll find that God rested or ceased on the seventh day of the week. Three times it's mentioned there that God rested, God sanctified, and God blessed the seventh day of the week. And in the fourth commandment, it says that God established the Sabbath in commemoration of His work as the Creator. And so the Sabbath is not only a sign for the Jews that God is the Creator, the Sabbath is a sign for Christians that God is the Creator as well. Now I mentioned Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. So let's go there very quickly, Galatians chapter 3. In fact, let's read beginning with verse 26. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. It says there in Galatians 3 and verse 26 the following. It's referring to Christians. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So who is the seed of Abraham? The literal Jews who live in Jerusalem? Physically, maybe. But spiritually speaking, clearly the Apostle Paul states that those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord are children of Abraham, even though they are not literally so, which means that the Sabbath applies to God's spiritual Israel today as well. Let's notice a couple of other verses before we bring this to a close. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. Here the Apostle Paul says something very strange. He says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. What is an outward Jew? One who has practiced circumcision. So it says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Once again, circumcision is of the heart. When a person is converted to Jesus Christ, that person becomes, according to the Apostle Paul, a Jew, a spiritual Jew. So the Sabbath must apply to the spiritual Jew as it applied to the literal Jew in the past. Notice also Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Now he says something really strange. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. He say not all Israelites are Israel. Now that seems to be contradictory. What did he mean? Verse 7, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Not all children of Abraham are children of Abraham, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. But in Isaac your seed shall be called, because the Messiah came from Isaac. Verse 8, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, that is of the promise of the Messiah, are counted as seed. Now do you know that in the Bible the Sabbath is never called the Sabbath of the Jews? Not once. 
It's always the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's spoken of, God speaks of it as my holy day. He says it is a sign between me and Israel. And Israel includes not only literal Israelites, but the Israel that has joined Jesus Christ. They are children of Abraham. There are certain celebrations of the Old Testament that are referred to as of the Jews. If you go to the Gospel of John, for example, you'll find that several times it speaks of the Passover of the Jews. You'll find the, the expression, it was the Feast of Tabernacles of the Jews. So when it comes to the feasts that were fulfilled, when, uh, when Jesus um, actually accomplished those things in person, then those things are called of the Jews. But the Sabbath is never referred to as the Sabbath of the Jews. So when Christians today say, oh no, you, you Adventists, you keep that Jewish Sabbath. We keep the Christian Sabbath, which is Sunday. Nowhere in the Bible does, the, does it say that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. We're going to notice in our next study that the idea of the observance of Sunday comes from the Roman Empire through the papacy to apostate Protestantism. In other words, this celebration of Sunday has no biblical foundation whatsoever. You can look from Genesis to Revelation. You'll never find that it says that Sunday is holy, that we're supposed to go to church on Sunday, that Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. You find that absolutely nowhere. It is a human tradition that has been handed down from generation to generation and Christians simply accept it as fact because their ministers say so, because their priests say so. The question is, are we going to be faithful to the Lord or are we going to be faithful to tradition? You know, once again, the sign that the people in Jerusalem saw was the eagle and the sun, the Romans worshiping the sun. At the end of time, the nation represented by an eagle is going to proclaim a national Sunday law. You say, Pastor Bohr, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. Just watch. Remember what I'm telling you today. The United States will impose a national Sunday law, a day of worship, which the Bible does not say is a day of worship. And it will enforce it by law, and whoever does not abide by it, Scripture says that they will be persecuted. And even the book of Revelation says that a death decree will be given against God's people. They will not be able to buy or sell unless they receive the mark or the sign of the beast, which is the opposite of the sign or the mark of God, His Holy Sabbath. 